tonight he's going to speak about efforts to place markers on the graves of Finians. George? Thank you. Thank you. Committee for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, the format for what I'm going to say is a little bit, I would not say it is logical or even chronological, but it is, um, it is assembled in the order of the way that my mind works. So hold on to your chairs. Uh, there's one thing you will not expect tonight, and that is. I will not speak as loudly as Scott Malloy. <laughs> so you can remain calm. Um, so first, I'm going to I, I'm going to give you an explanation of what the Fenian Memorial Committee of America is. Uh, it is a small group of people, relatively small group of people. Uh, composed of a few activists in Rhode Island and then a board of advisors throughout a number of states in the United States, Ireland and Austra Western Australia. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in a minute, why, why we have that configuration of people who are advisors. Um, its roots are in, um, as all roots are, no matter what, big-minded, bullyish historians tell you, based in stories. The origins of things, remember that, are based in stories. So, you know the, the old line when somebody says, everybody has a story. Boy, if you want to research Irish history and Irish American history, get ready for stories. Get ready for stories. Because this story of this committee began where else but the most renowned, affluent, majestic place in Rhode Island, Central Falls. <laughs> where I was a teacher and a couple of my um, my old um, notorious colleagues are here uh, tonight, thankfully, uh, to make sure that I'm still behaving myself, I suppose. I was a teacher there. Of course, I have been a long-term activist going back 40 years. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, as I said earlier. And I was very involved in New York and in Ireland during the time that I've spent in Ireland over the years, which is, which is quite a bit. <coughs> A woman rang me when I lived on the east side of Providence about another matter. And she was from Philadelphia. And at the end of the conversation, she said to me, before you hang up, there's a Fenian buried near you. And I said, okay. And 
I said, who is he? She said, I don't know his name, but he's not far from your house. <laughs> well, if you have an ounce of intelligence and an ounce of inquisitiveness in your personality, you're hooked. You're not gonna let that go. So I lived with it for quite a while until I saw a booklet that had to do with local history in Pawtucket. And I saw a photograph of a man tending a grave in St. Mary's Cemetery, the famous cemetery in Pawtucket. And it was the grave of a man named James Wilson. And it said Irish Patriot underneath and the name of his wife, Lucy Wilson. Now this is quite a few years ago. <clears throat> I tried, I have to be honest now, in, in, in front of you, my friends, and uh, in front of God today, I tried to ignore it. But it haunted me, actually, to find out who this man was. And eventually, I started to research where he was and where he came from. I had some basic details, but that was about it. Well, don't you know that James McNally Wilson, whose memory due to the work that I have done with many other people in Rhode Island over the years now has become part of what I call the popular memory again. People generally know who James McNally Wilson is in the Irish American community and beyond. And it was because of a number of people who, like myself, don't settle for things. We got some basic information on him. We knew that he was Athenian. He had gone to Australia involuntarily, was sentenced to life uh, in prison, penal servitude, um, which in some ways was worse than what his original sentence would, uh, was, which was death. And he wrote a very famous letter called The Voice from the Tomb or The Letter from the Tomb, depending on who's uh, referring to it. Now, he was a military Fenian, unlike uh, uh, some other Fenians who were not. Well, what's the difference? A military Fenian was someone <clears throat> who had been in the British military, and while there, usually, in some cases before they went in, but in most cases, while they were in the British military, they swore a secret oath and allegiance to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which became the Fenians in common terms, terminology. So they not only were people who were uh, sworn to fight the crown and its presence in Ireland, but they were considered absolute and total traitors because they had been members of the British military. Uh, and that's who James Wilson was, who, by the way, his real name was McNally, and that's why he's referred to very often now as James McNally Wilson. Where did the word, where did the name Wilson come from? Well, when he went into the military, he changed his name to Wilson. He obviously knew where he was headed, and. His real name was McNally from birth, and he was from County Down, from Newry and County Down. This letter was to John Devoy, and through John Devoy to Clan Nagal, another secret organization. <clears throat> and Devoy had been a uh, a prisoner himself in Western Australia. And he was also uh, Athenian. He had become a fairly renowned Irish-American newspaper man in New York. He had gotten a series of letters previously, not just from Wilson, from this prison, from prisoners. But this letter, the voice from the tomb, or the letter from the tomb, was extremely moving. And he felt in a way, in my tiny little way, the way that I felt 
when I found out that this pinion was very in Pawtucket. It didn't leave him, and the others he shared it with, it didn't leave them, until they came to a point where they made a decision to have an absurd, ridiculous attempt at rescuing some of these pinions from Western Australia. How? On a whaling vessel going from New Bedford, of all things. Obviously something that would work very easily, Thomas, right? <laughs> the captain and Yeah. <laughs> They had to get a captain out of retirement, Captain Anthony, who was, had no Irish connections, but he did have a connection with a, an American revolutionary family, his own, and they didn't have, I would say, a soft place in their heart for the British Empire. He was talked into it, and to make a very long story short, eventually they sailed from New Bedford to Western Australia to rescue some of these Kenyans. <clears throat> With a crew, except for a couple of these men that were on there, total, the captain and others, who was also a Fenian sympathizer, that didn't know, who didn't know that they were going to rescue them. <laughs> they were on a whaling expedition as far as they knew. It gets worse if you don't know the story. They got to the other side of the world and with the help of people like Father Patrick McKay, mm -hmm. They rescued six Fenians. They were fired on as they were going away from the coast. They were fired on. They were going to be fired on by the uh, British gunboat, a British gunboat, until Captain Anthony said, "If you fire on this ship, you fire on the American flag, the American nation." So, in the the a great display of their tremendous. Bravado, the bridge turned around and went back to shore. Now that's it in a capsule, but of, of how this all began in terms of my personal story and the story of this committee. It began with a story that I started to explore about someone's <coughs> past. And if you think about some, anything in your life, you can find stories throughout your life that you have become fairly well educated about and maybe even an activist about. Doesn't have to be Irish. We forget the acorn that the tree came from. We forget it. We forget that these things begin with uh, an inquisitive nature and a realization that when we look for history, there's one place that we very often forget to look, and that's underneath our feet. So Rhode Island has this connection to this James McNally Wilson who was buried in this cemetery in St. Mary's. And in my case, it led me to begin a exploratory project with a number of students. I was in English as a second language uh, teacher at that time. And the, the six students who became involved were all from countries other than the United States. None of them from Ireland. Uh, so they became part of the, the Search for James Wilson Roundtable. Those students sat at a roundtable, weekly basis, uh, monthly basis, with adults from Irish American organizations and community historians. And we became more and more involved with finding out who the heck James McNally Wilson really was. And don't you know that in the process of exploring this, 
we found that James McNally Wilson spent most of his life after he arrived in the United States, land of the free and the home of the brave, for sure, for him and the men who escaped. Where did he spend it? He spent it in Central Falls. Well, that's a coincidence, isn't it? And where did he spend it in Central Falls? He spent it on Cross Street in Central Falls. And the day we discovered that, one of the students that were uh, researching this with us said, excuse me, Mr. McLaughlin. And I said, yes. She said, I live across from that house. <laughs> so every day that she arose from her bed, she looked out the window and she was looking at James McNally Wilson's home. Uh, only in his later years that he actually lived in Pawtucket. Um, and he spent his last year in the home of the Little Sisters of the Poor. Little coincidence, I'm a volunteer for the Little Sisters of the Poor. Okay, you're getting my drift here. Um, this whole idea of coincidence is since I'm a believer, I think has to be providential. When you hit number 25 or 26, we think it's providential. <clears throat> if you're not a believer, you start tripping over yourself and you say, maybe I will become a believer. Because we found so many things that were ironic and coincidental in the story of James McNally Wilson, it made us feel compelled to continue to discover things about him. Um, he, when he wrote this letter, now this is, these are, these are men who are not, very, you know, what we would consider nowadays not highly educated, okay? When he wrote his letter, I'm going to read you an excerpt of what he wrote <coughs> to, uh, in, in this famous letter to Du Bois that stirred him so much to action uh, that they went halfway around the world to rescue him and the other men. What a death is staring us in the face. The death of a felon in a British dungeon and a grave amongst Britain's ruffians. I'm not ashamed to speak the truth that it is a disgrace to have us in prison today a little money judiciously expended would release every man that is now in West Australia. Think that we have been very nearly nine years in this living tomb since our first arrest and that it is impossible for mind or body to withstand the continual strain that is upon us. One or the other must give way. Fiend James Wilson was imprisoned with other Irish political prisoners halfway around the world in that dreaded penal colony called Fremantle. But to underline the message, Wilson added, remember, this is a voice from the tomb. For well, is it not a living tomb? In the tomb it is only a man's body that is good for worms. But in this living tomb, the canker worm of care enters the very soul. So if you imagine yourself as an ex-prisoner, as John Du Bois was, receiving a letter like that, it might have a, a very, very deep effect on you as it did. The man he was arrested with, by the way, James McNally Wilson, was Martin Hogan. And Martin Hogan had written the letter as well. In order that you may recollect who addresses you, you will remember on the night of January 17, 1866, some of the 5th Dragoon Guards being held in the old house on Clare Lane with John Du Bois and Captain McCafferty. I am one of that unfortunate band and now am under sentence of life, penal servitude in one of the darkest corners of the earth. 
And as far as we can learn from my small news, that chances to reach us, we appear to be forgotten. With no prospect before us, but to be left in hopeless slavery to the tender mercies of the Norman wolf. But, my dear friend, it is not my ha hard fate I deplore, for I willingly bear it for the cause of dear old Ireland. But I must feel sad at the thought of being forgotten and neglected by those more fortunate companions in enterprise who have succeeded, including the grasp of the oppressor. If I had the means, I could get away from here anytime. I therefore address you in the hope that you will endeavor to procure and send me pecuniary help for that purpose, and I will soon be with you. At the end, he says, please direct your letter to Reverend Father McCabe, Fremantle. Do not put my name on the outside of the letter. That's a little hint about Father McCabe and what Father McCabe did for these men and why we call him a secret hero. So going back to the development of this committee, eventually we had a series of events, and we uh, had the author of The Voyage of the Catalpa come to visit Central Falls in Rhode Island and lecture. We had a commemoration at the grave of James McNally Wilson. Uh, years later, we put in a plaque, a memorial plaque for him. We found out the people that he was buried with, other than his wife Lucy, who uh, Wakler, who we had married here. Uh, were Frank and Mary Byrne, who were part of the Invincibles, a notorious Fenian group, um, and they had fled from France, where they had fled to from Ireland, okay? So, um, very, very interesting. We found lots of details about things. We found uh, who the people in Rhode Island were who helped get them here who paid for their burial, who witnessed their burial as small children. Uh, the, the, uh, our, my students actually videotaped interviews with people. One of the men delivered their, uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood pension. I'm going like this because he always said in the interview, and then I would get the pension every month and I would, he would have it with a safety pin, okay, over his pocket and he would give it to Mr. Wilson. So the Irish Republican Brotherhood never forgot him with the, they didn't have the great means, but they were able to at least remember him symbolically throughout his life. Um, so we found out many details about him. Well, the more we found out, of course, the more we had to find out about Hogan, and about the other men who had escaped. And as that began to take place, we started to discover some of these people didn't even have gravestones, never mind not having memorial markers, like the one that we put in with Wilson, for Wilson. So, as time went on, eventually we, we helped with that and we became the Fenian Memorial Committee of America because no matter what anybody tells you here or in Ireland, because there are some people in Ireland, I'm sorry to say, who can get a little snooty and they can get a little, how should I say, West Britain. When it comes to Irish America, because we are ridiculed sometimes for our deep affection mm -hmm. for our past and our connection to people like the bold fiends. I just sent a letter about a week or so ago to the Irish Times. It didn't get printed, but 
it will get printed when someone writes my biography. <laughs> and what I said was, <clears throat> how dare someone ridicule Americans for carrying a banner in the New York City St. Patrick's Day parade that says England get out of Ireland? Because there were some of these West Britons who did in Ireland ridicule those who carry it. And they've been carrying it for a very long time, by the way. Why is that important to us? Because Irish America is important. Not just Ireland and not just America. Irish America, which is a separate entity, as I would profess. And the Fenians are a great example of that. They are a wonderful example of the hope that America historically has given, combined with the perseverance and passion for freedom that the Irish have given. That's how we came to be called the Fenian Memorial Committee of America. We've developed to a certain degree now where we have advisors, a couple of whom are here right now, but I don't want to mention their name because they want to hide their money. <laughs> Those advisors, I saw people put their hands in their pockets. No. The advisors are in New England, in uh, New York, the other region, and down in the Washington, D.C. area. And then we have a smattering of other people in Minnesota, Chicago, Ireland and uh, Perth, Australia, which is close to Fremantle and Fremantle itself. And those advisors are all committed to keeping alive the popular memory of the Athenians in America and elsewhere. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, what have, what have we done and what are our plans? Uh, the past people that we have uh, taken care of in this regard are in uh, where Martin Hogan in Chicago, when I went to visit his grave, it was a very emotional experience because I was there with another actor, longtime activist, Mike, Michael Morley, and a fellow Brooklynite who lives in Chicago. And when we got to the grave, it was, there was nothing there. It was, it was just ground. Uh, well, we took care of that with the help of local people in Chicago, the committee, and we put in uh, a marker for him, uh, a gravestone, I should say. So, um, and in the process of that, found two of his descendants who attended the commemoration at the grave, <clears throat> along with Jimmy Ryan, who lives in New Bedford, who is the great-great-grandson of Captain Anthony the skipper of the vessel that rescued the Catalpa men. Um, then we went on to Philadelphia, same experience. No gravestones, two men um, there. Uh, one was the only Protestant of the six, group, of the six men who escaped. Um, and we put in the two tombstones for them. Uh, of course, the inscription at, at the end of these tombstones all say they never surrendered. They never surrendered. And they never did surrender because they were under a different kind of sentence, of course, <coughs> in exile. They could never go home. Um, and of course, they had gotten to the land of, of freedom, but they could never go back to their own roots and their own families and so on, of course. Um, and then we moved on to Father Patrick McCabe, my favorite, because Father Patrick McCabe was the man who, who smuggled in, as the parish priest for these prisoners, all of the communications with the Fenians in America. So uh, I said to someone the other day on the telephone who was interviewing me, uh, a man from the Anglo-Celt newspaper, actually, in County Cavan, uh, where Father McCabe comes from, I said, uh, he could have been hung. I said, actually, if they, if they thought they were capable of it, they would have hung him six or seven times uh, for all the things that he had done. He 
he must have had a tremendous conscience to put himself in jeopardy the way that he did. Uh, and he must have had deep sympathies, of course hidden for the most part, for, for those who would fight for liberation from uh, the Sasna, the, the English. So uh, he did this for quite a while, but a lot of it is still hidden. We don't know for sure. We do know that without him, John Boyle O'Reilly, the giant Fenian who was buried up near Boston, uh, who became, after he escaped to here with the help of Father McCabe, uh, crucial help of Father McCabe, he became the editor of the Boston Pilot. He became the, uh, a, a, a well-known poet. And he became a fierce abolitionist, the anti-slavery spokesman in, the, in, in this part of the world. Um, and died a, a tragic death early. But he never would have gotten out without Father McKay. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And then these six men from the Catalpa never would have escaped without Father McCabe and the communication that he smuggled in and out. Uh, what did he get for his reward, Father McCabe? He got exiled in America the same way that the men did. <coughs> he disappears from the map at some point in uh, the map of life, the map of history. In Australia, he disappears. We don't know where he is for a number of years, and then he reappears meeting John Boyle O'Reilly in America and swearing to see him again at some point. He never does because O'Reilly dies very young. And where does Father McCabe reappear? He reappears in a small town. Get ready, here comes the god of coincidence. He reappears in a town, outside of a town, in rural southern Minnesota. Very odd. Where? Annie, my wife, comes from. Town of 6,000. Town of 6,000, so, Farm okay. All right, so, uh, he reappears there, and he reappears with the help of Archbishop John Ireland, who had imported many, many other Irish immigrants, not just priests, from shanty towns in places like New York, so that they could have a rural life and they could adjust to becoming Americans. When, Arch, when uh, Father uh, McCabe was originally ordained, when he went to seminary, he went there and was told at, that he would be assigned to Western Australia as a missionary. He knew it from the beginning. And he did. But then he winds up in Minnesota, of all places, the frozen tundra of the beautiful state of Minnesota. I don't want to go too far without the frozen tundra. <laughs> So, um, and he becomes the pastor there for many years, and he passes away in 1899. Now, a number of years later, or many years later, I should say, uh, 60 years later, I think, he, the, uh, oh, I, I should say, and you will see photographs of this, beautiful, the, the, he was beloved. And people knew his basic story about John Burrell O'Reilly and something about the Catalpa. But they didn't know a lot of the details. He didn't talk about it much. Now, I'm going to backtrack on that. When people escaped here, who were Fenians or any, anybody of their ilk, they didn't just go out and frolic for the rest of their lives with abandon because they had nothing to worry about. The British were very famous for their agents who throughout the world would actually kidnap people and bring them back to their quote unquote justice. So there was always a third eye that was looking for all of these men, I assume also for Father McCabe, 
at whether or not this could end quickly. So <clears throat> the parishioners built a beautiful uh, Celtic cross at his graveside in dedication to him, no mention of his role with the Fenian. Fair enough. <clears throat> 60 years later, they raised the church because the farming community had dissipated to a certain degree and they had people had gone to town to another church called Sacred Heart Church. And oh, of course, as I was discovering this, I said, Sacred Heart Church? That's the church that Annie went to in Minnesota. What a coincidence. Be awful. And one family had saved the stained glass window that was in St. Mary's Church in the deeply rural area outside of the town that was dedicated to Father McCabe when he died. They refused to allow it to be destroyed until they could put it in a proper place in another church or chapel. Well, when they expanded the church in Sacred Heart, where did they put the stained glass window? In that church. Well, that was the church that Annie went to every Sunday. And when the sun came in that side of the building, she was looking at an inscription for Father McKay. Oh, it's just a coincidence, of course. So we took on the, the job of taking care of Father McKay now, of paying tribute, as it will say on his, on his marker at the foot of his grave, an incline marker, it will say, Good Margaret, thank you, an Irish, brave and faithful priest, Father McKay, long overdue. That's our job in groups like this, and the 1916 committee as well, obviously, and the famine, the famine committee and so on. So what is our job? Our job is to resurrect popular memory that's connected to our own passion. Because without that, we are all, in a strange sort of a way, lost, are we? Because we can't connect ourselves to the things that we know that are there, but we can't identify them. So this project now for Father McCabe, will, we will finish this on May 18th, outside of Waseca, Minnesota, and Annie will be there. And uh, we will have a, a hooli, as they say, afterwards, and a great toast to the great man that he was, Father Patrick McCabe, the secret hero. After that project, we will move on to Michael Harrington, who's one of the Catalpa Six. He's from McCroom in County Cork. Thomas Hassett, also, he's from Donorail in County Cork both buried in Calvary Cemetery in Queens. Beyond that, we have, well, this is if I live this long. Now, if I don't live this long, somebody else will take it. I keep saying we. You know, I mean we in a qualitative sense, okay? Qualified sense. Catherine Hughes was a famous Irish-Canadian woman who was the founder of the Catholic Women's League, which in those days was a, was a pretty important thing. Um, <clears throat> and from a family in Prince Edward Island, uh, in Canada. And she's buried in St. Raymond's Cemetery in the cemetery in the Bronx. She sided with the anti-treatyites uh, uh, during the Irish Civil War, um, after the agreement was, was made with, uh, about, uh, about Ireland and creating a free state. Um, but she never got a marker and she died to a certain degree alone because she, she stuck to her beliefs. Um, and beyond Catherine Hughes, we, we have a series of people who helped with the Catalpa rescue. There are a lot of people, we could spend at least a week here talking about the list of people who helped the Catalpa rescue actually happen. They could have all been hung, all of them. Um, so we're going through that list and we're coming up with people who, if they don't have markers, uh, we will put them there or in some uh, cases, gravestones. Um, 
So James McNally Wilson, Martin Hogan, Thomas Dara, Robert Cranston, and then Michael Harrington, Thomas Hassett to come, Catherine Hughes, and other people who were helpers like Father McCabe are in our future. The, uh, the Fenians themselves are a, were a fulcrum, and I think this is very important. People hear the term Fenian a lot, especially in Irish American circles. And the Fenians were a fulcrum for what eventually happened in 1916. Without the Fenians, I've heard someone give a lecture in New York recently about this, and the name of the lecture was, Without the Fenians, question mark. Without the Fenians, 1916, which was a failure, of course, but it was, as we have incorporated into our Irish genetic structure, the failure becomes the glory later and the success beyond. And that's what happened in 1916. Without the Fenians, I don't think so. I don't think so. The Fenians were extremely important in uh, Irish history and Irish American history. Um, our plans to remember these men are all centered on individual personal sacrifice and this is the thing very often we forget in movements we think of grand numbers of people moving in lockstep together because they all believe in exactly the same thing which is absurd each of us every day hopefully with great courage do whatever is necessary to follow what we feel we could not live without doing. And that's what the Fenians were. We, uh, we, we will honor Father McCabe, and I'm going to give you in, in May, and I'm just going to leave you with a couple of things about him. Um, where he was from and so on. He was born to Patrick and Anne McCabe on the 25th of October, 1822. Other sources say 1827, his birth year. In Arnahan, County Cavan, we just, you'll see in the, uh, in the display here, uh, we, we were just there in February where he was born. County Cavan on the shores of Loch Gowna. He was ordained in March, 1859 by the Right Reverend Monsignor H.C. Whelan for the Diocese of Perth in Western Australia, arriving there on August 8th. Um, he was a well-known Roman Catholic clergyman in St. Mary's, eventually. A small mission near Wasika. His death rec was recalled as an exploit, recalled after his death, his exploits of international interest were recalled and he was a conspicuous actor in it. It was Father McCabe who was instrumental in liberating the political prisoner, John Boyle O'Reilly, who afterward became the noted American poet. Um, and in liberating the, the six men uh, later. My final thing I wanna say before we look at the, uh, the uh, photographs is, um, something that I wrote for the infamous Dr. Machiavelli Malloy, <laughs> otherwise known as Scott. When he wants something, boy, he doesn't let you go. I don't know how many of you do. He's worse than I am. I said, that's why we get along. We're both ruthless. <laughs> he gets it done, though. God bless you. So, so and, and this piece was from the uh, Last year, uh, the, in the uh, uh, St. Patrick's booklet, St. Patrick's Parade booklet in Providence. And the title of it is, 
So why Irish American history? Uh, the, the background of this is we, we are not poor cousins, okay? We're not poor cousins, and remember that. So why Irish American history? We often focus on our ability to see a clear path ahead of us, socially or politically, spiritually, but history is important because we can't clearly see the path behind us otherwise. Sometimes the best way forward is to go back. Maybe we don't want to see what is too painful, too enlightening, too demeaning, or too confusing. Maybe the past is crowded with the unknown. Those innately or marginally connected to us whom we sense are trying to tell us something. Yes, maybe the dead are following us. And so it is with this writer from Brooklyn, New York, who lives in Providence, Rhode Island, with roots in Donegal, Westmeath, and Longford. He's being followed by the dead, too. Years ago, with a small group of avid immigrant high school students, Irish-American activists, and community historians, I began looking back at some of those dead, trying to make out their faces and their own lives. After another familiar activist told me, there's a Fenian buried near you, you might want to find out more about him. Since then, I have been following the dead. The Fenian dead. And who were the Fenians anyway? What forces and events formed them? The Fenian organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, headed by James Stevens, was formed on St. Patrick's Day, 1858, by exiled rebels who had taken part in yet another short-lived and unsuccessful rising in 1848. Yet another effort. Yet another effort towards Irish freedom in response to Ungurta Moor, the Irish famine, or the English negligent genocidal loss, depending on who interprets it. At least one million died and one and a half million immigrated. There was no doubt how the Fenians interpreted it. Stephen's comrade, John O'Mahony, went to America and set up the apparatus for money and arms to support the IRB in Ireland. During and after yet another failed rebellion in 1866 and another betrayal, the Catalpa Six, all military Fenians who had served in the British Army were sentenced to death for treason. A sentence later commuted to penal servitude in what some have called a fate worse than death in the Crown's prison in Fremantle, Western Australia. 19th century Australia could be called the moon of that time. The prison had the bush on one side and the ocean on the other. The prisoners aged quickly. Eventually, the prisoners found a friend in Catholic priest, Father Patrick McKay. And the rest, as you heard, is history. Afterwards, Fenians in America, notably John DeVoy and Clan McGale, helped these men resettle throughout the country with the help of many supporters. What of the secret hero in this story, Father Patrick McKay? He had to flee Australia too, eventually. There's no mention of his whereabouts until he reappears in Minnesota in a small town called Wasika. You've heard about the coincidence there. He got there because of the help given to him by Archbishop John Ireland, who had resettled many, many Irish immigrants in Minnesota. <clears throat> Ireland himself was Irish born and from the county of Kilkenny. The impact of the Fenians and other exiles in America on the development of a new identity the Irish-American, the 
was profound. And that influence did not stop at the sea. It leapt across it, helping to form and invigorate the 1916 resistance and beyond to this very day. But Irish America has unfinished business. James McNally Wilson had his name and that of his wife etched on a stone in Rhode Island with nothing at his grave indicating his role in the Catalpa escape or his heroism that led him to prison in the first place. Martin Hogan, arrested with his comrade Wilson, buried in Chicago, had no gravestone. Two other members of the Catalpa Six, Robert Cranston and Thomas Dara, had been buried without gravestones in Philadelphia. They all have stories, but they all have markers now, that's for sure. Father McCabe, the brave and faithful priest who spent his life in silent exile in the wilds of Minnesota, has no marker that specifically memorializes his brave role in the escape of Fenians to the land of freedom halfway around the world. Our current campaign will take care of that. Some say, don't look back, but we say, look back, and you will see yourself walking with the Fenians. As we uncover the hidden tombs and stories of Irish America and its deep roots in the march towards an unshackled nation, let us remember that sometimes even coincidence in our search and research might just be someone behind us calling. Listen to him. Listen to her. They are our ancestors of this somewhat odd, vibrant, passionate people who absolutely refuse to go away called Irish Americans. Thank you for your support, and thank you for having me this evening. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a few questions later if you want to ask me. But we, we're going to show some, some of the slides so you can see the graves that we've helped to put in and um, some places, even the old homestead where Father McCabe was from. And I'll, I'll narrate a little bit of it as we go along. So I've been showing some, you didn't know it. Okay. <laughs> they know it. Yeah. That's so why everybody was, when I kept saying, there's someone behind me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, yes, you're right. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's Captain Anthony, the, uh, a real character, you can tell. Uh, what a great old Yankee he was, boy. He just was put his life at stake. Uh, he was a Quaker, that's right. He came from a Quaker family, that's right. Uh, he, um, he was the... Um, the skipper of the vessel, wonderful man, who was paid tribute to by many, many Irish uh, afterwards, yeah, of course. Uh, th this is the manifest, this is after they arrived in New York, uh, District of New York, Port of New York, their, their signatures and so on. Um, that's the Catalpa, the Bark Catalpa of New Bedford, the whaling vessel. This is a depiction of the rescue from the shore. Yeah, six men. Uh, the American flag that flew over the Catalpa and persuaded the British not to fire on the ship, which is now in the National Museum of Ireland. There's the Catalpa again. <coughs> there, there's six men after they arrived in New York. There they are. The Great Escape, incredible jailbreak of six Fenians from Fremantle in 1876. A cartoon from the Irish world, September 2nd, 1876, the year of the escape, um, holding his shackles that are broken now. Uh, Peter Stevens, who is author of the book, The Voyage of the Catalpa, the modern book that is about the, uh, the whole escape, uh, Jimmy Ryan, who's a d direct descendant of uh, Captain Anthony, um, and Brendan Woods, 
uh, another uh, Irish historian, the original Irish flag that flew over the Catalpa. Uh, this is a Catalpa rescue commemorative stone revised and recast in 2010 by the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick in Bedford, Massachusetts. I, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't say that the original one had misinformation on it. Although I love Irish America, we don't always get everything right. So it, it'd be put in there, and they, they put John Boyle O'Reilly as one of these the Catalpa escapees, and he wasn't. There's a Catalpa Memorial, Rockingham, Western Australia. I've been on the radio in Western Australia and everything. Western Australia, phenomenal. They, they have kept this alive. Uh, quite a few descendants, quite a few people in Australia come from prisoner stock. And many of them are Irish Australians, okay? Yeah. So, and in Western Australia, there's really a lot of them, okay? Yeah. Uh, so they revere, they revere the Fenians, definitely. Commemoration honoring James McNally Wilson at his graveside. That was there. And then the, uh, this is Search for James Wilson Roundtable, some of us, meeting at the Central Falls Library, back when I was a lot younger. Uh, uh, this is the baptismal certificate, which we went and got at, um, in the Diocese of Drumore in, um, in Newry, in, in County Down for James McNally, James McNally Wilson. That's his home. That's where he lived on Cross Street. Right that house? Still there? You imagine in that house. Sorry. Still there? Yeah. Is that, he's not still there. <laughs> <laughs> the house is still there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there. He may be there. Maybe may be hiding out. There he is in his older age now in the middle. This is James McNally Wilson in the middle. Uh, still fierce as ever. And he's got two men in uh, their uh, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what the modern term you would use for it, uh, kind of practice military, uh, you know, and they have belt buckles that say IV on the front, Irish volunteers, I, not intravenous, uh, Irish volunteers, and uh, they're with him. So he was fierce to the end, yeah. Uh, the residence on Utter Street in Pawtucket, where Wilson lived with the McConaughey's during his twilight years. This is uh, the John Jugan residence, formerly the home for the aged, operated by the Little Sisters of the Poor. He spent his last days there, although this is the new building, uh, which is in the, in the one that was before this, uh, of course. And, uh, here's a, a, a clipping from I can't read that, it's, is it 1971? Yeah. Uh, 50 attend graveside ceremony. So uh, there were there were people, Tom, were you at that? You were at that. Ah. I knew it was Tom. Ah. Oh. Ah. Talk about being fierce, Tom. <laughs> fierce. Yeah, so uh, beautiful. And that is, that, that's just a, a program for uh, one of the gatherings we had. That's the James McNally Wilson. Uh, grave before we put the plaque in. Yeah, that's the body inscription at the bottom with the, uh, he and his wife, Lucy, and... Died 1921. They died in 1921, oddly, coincidentally, 1921. Uh, well, anybody know him? Father John McNulty? Yeah, yeah, giving a blessing at the grave. Uh, gravestone unveiling honoring Martin, Martin Hogan. Now this is in Chicago, two years ago. 2015. 2015. Uh, there's Martin Hogan after he got here. He looks a little fierce, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Martin Hogan. And that's, that's what we put in for him, Fiend Martin Hogan. The Voyage of the Catalpa. Died in 1901. Uh, that's uh, Professor Ruan O'Donnell from the University of Limerick, who's helped us a lot and is on the advisory board. That's some weird guy. I don't know who that was. Uh, <laughs> Father Dave Dillon, who gave the benediction in Chicago, is a Carmelite. That's the crowd. Richard Willix uh, and his sister, actually, uh, great grandson and great granddaughter of Martin Hogan of the people in, in Chicago found, located. That's Jimmy Ryan, Captain Anthony's great-grandson. Wonderful thing that happens sometimes when we have these is 
these people meet each other. You know? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, beautiful. This is John T. Richardson. He was the shipping agent to the Catalpa and Captain Anthony's father-in-law. That's the flag that was on the ship. Gravestone unveilings honoring Robert Cranston and Thomas Dara in Philadelphia, May 5th, 2018. We did that on purpose. It's Bobby Sands Day, the day that he passed away. Uh, Fenian Patriots, that's the uh, program. That was the unmarked grave for Cranston. And then here, Robert Cranston, Irish Patriot, both Fenian and escapee on the Catalpa from Fremantle Jail in Western Australia. He never surrendered. Unmarked grave, Thomas Dara. In a different cemetery, this is a Protestant cemetery. Same inscription. And in the middle at the top, in between the two, there's a raised, it looks like a photograph. There's a photo, a prison photo of him in the Catalpa next to him. Seamus Boyle is a past president of the ancient order of Hibernian speaking. Uh, some of those people who are pipers, coincidentally, worked on Duffy's Cut. If you know about the, oh yeah, right. Yeah, Duffy's Cut in Pennsylvania. Wonderful people. Uh, that's the reception afterwards. Uh, little music. Brave and faithful priest, Father. Father, there he is, Father Patrick McCabe, who smuggled communications in and out of Fremantle Jail, including Wilson's letter from the tomb. <coughs> This is his homestead in Lot Gowna County Cabin. I'll tell you about this when we're finished. Another coincidence. The one on the right is a... The one on the right is Maeve. She's well, a sister. Are. She's a nun. <laughs> sister Maeve Brady, who is his great-great-grandniece and her cousin next Tom. to her, Tim. Tom. Tom, sorry. Tom. We're entering the home. What's the remnants of the homestead? It's low land, the poorest land, the worst land, very low, near a, near a lake, a giant lake. Um, only two homes would have been there at that time. Where is this? Is this Ireland or Minnesota? This is Ireland. This is where he comes from. He comes from County County Cabin. This is where he was Lock born. Lock Gowna, a townland called Arnahan. Yeah. So you can see the remains there. of, there's still, yeah, look at that, something. Now, Sister Maeve kept saying to me as we walked through this, because she had never seen it. She kept saying to me as a punctuation in her speech, unbelievable, George. Unbelievable. Pondering Father McCabe's long journey from his home in County Cabin to Australia and the United States. There's Arnahan. And there he is. There he is. Did McCabe get stationed in Australia as, as punishment, or was no. that no. That's no, no, no. just I, where I, he ended I'll up? I'll explain it in a second. I just want to get this for a second. This St. Mary Church, that's the, hap that's the church that eventually was raised. That was his church. They, they, this, they got rid of that church. That, but the pe local people made a memorial to the church. They really take care of the cemetery, even though the parish is in the town now. There's his, uh, there's his uh, Celtic cross that they put up for him. He was obviously beloved. But no mention of anything about what he did for the Fenians. But they can't be all bad out there, I'll tell you, because when I when I rang the priest and when I went to see him, there's Sacred Heart, the, the, the church in the town that has the stained glass window. There is stained glass window installed in Sacred Heart Church, Wasika, Minnesota, in memory of Reverend Patrick McCabe. That was brought from the old church. In memoriam, Reverend Patrick McCabe. But when I asked the priest originally if we could, if, if he would help and we could do this, he said, of course. 
This is what it's going to say on his grave. He played a heroic role in the escape of Fenians, including John Boyle O'Reilly in 1869 and six others on the whaler Catawpa in 1876, from the English penal colony in Fremantle, Western Australia, to freedom in America. Go to Margaret, brave and faithful priest, the Catawpa Rescue, the Fenian Memorial Committee of America, 18th of May, 2019. And that's it. And that's it. She had a question, right? <laughs> yeah, so the question was, was he sent to Australia as punishment? No, as I said earlier, he was ordained for Australia. Yeah. In those days, you could be, even if you weren't in a missionary order, you, would, you could be ordained, you could go to seminary with the expectation that at the end, you were going to be assigned to a place far away. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to him. He knew that he was going to the Diocese of Perth in Western Australia. 